as a way of welcoming all of you tonight, I just wanted to say that music has been a part of the military experience since ancient, ancient times. And whether that be for uh, communication over long distances, whether it be uh, for army organization in camp or on the battlefield, uh, for recruitment purposes to keep the army strong, uh, for ceremony, both joyful and solemn, and whether it be for uh, morale issues and just simply light entertainment. Music has been with us uh, all the way uh, through military history. Uh, we see music being used on the battlefields of ancient China. We see it uh, in the Middle East. And uh, Europeans will encounter this uh, during the great battles of the Crusades. And they're going to take uh, what they see and hear with them back to Europe. And that seed will be planted and it shall sprout and grow and twist uh, into the forms uh, that we may recognize a little bit more closely today. And even in uh, this country, uh, the United States, music has been with us since the very, uh, the very moment of awakening. Um, young John Diamond uh, playing uh, two arms uh, on his field drum in the early morning hours on Lexington Green in 1775. And a few miles away, uh, later in the afternoon, the fife and drum uh, astride uh, the bridge there at Concord. And all through uh, American history through this day. So with this really rich heritage, you know, we have to ask ourselves, you know, th that there must be something there that there must be something uh, worthy for our attention. And indeed there is. If we want to have a thorough understanding of military history and uh, a thorough appreciation of the soldier experience, we absolutely must study music as a part of our exploration of history and military history. So I wanna thank you all for joining us this evening. I think this is a really important topic and I'm so excited to share this evening uh, with all of you. So with that, I would like to uh, bring to the fore um, Master Sergeant Lee LaFosse. Um, Lee uh, received her uh, Bachelor's of Music uh, from Texas Tech University, as well as her Master's Degree in Music. And she went on to receive uh, a doctorate in Musical Arts at the uh, Indiana University an absolute powerhouse of musical study uh, here in America's heartland. And she has been a member of the US Army Band since uh, 2007. And she has been uh, an instructor and an educator in music uh, throughout her adult life. She has had the fine opportunity to play with some of the finest symphony orchestras in our nation. And uh, she now chairs the uh, education and the Outreach Department for the United States Army Band. So please uh, welcome, if you would, Master Sergeant Lee LaFosse and Pershing Zone. Lee? Hello, everybody. Thank you, John, for that great introduction. You said everything that I would ever have possibly said about myself right now. Yes, my name's Lee. I'm a clarinet player in the Army Band. Uh, I love the education outreach. That's kind of been my focus, especially since we've been doing all this social distancing. Um, and I'm really excited to get to talk to y'all tonight about the Army Band, where we came from, and where we're kind of going. Uh, I got to do a lot of research for this presentation, so I learned a lot, and I'm hoping to share a lot of what I learned with you. So without further ado, let's begin. So the United States Army Band, when I started thinking about how to define us, I would say stewards of ceremony is a great way to kind of pinpoint what it is we do and what we've been doing through history. Where did we start? Where did we come from? Have you guys heard of General Blackjack Pershing? He is the man who said, you will organize and equip the Army Band. And this was in January 1922. Um, he had heard European bands and said that the United States absolutely needed to create bands that would rival those musical elements, which is why he decided we needed to have a band. So I wanted to share with you this little hold on, clip about Pershing. 
He took delight in showing the marshal the evidence of solid French-American friendship, which the two commanders had done so much to forge. When the body of the unknown soldier was returned from France for burial, Pershing led the nation in its tribute. Showing the measure of his own respect for the nation's heroes, Pershing wore only the victory medal, which was awarded to every veteran of the World War. So I wanted to show that clip because it mentioned the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier and how, if you caught that, was 1921 when that started, uh, which was right before the band was formed. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about what it is we do there, but that's one of the jobs that we cover very, very often is the laying of the wreath at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. So I liked the tie-in with uh, General Pershing there. So the music starts. January 1922, we're coming up on our 100 year anniversary, which is exciting. We have some big plans in the works, which I'm pumped about. Uh, but this is where we began. This is the first picture of the United States Army Band, which I think is kind of cool. The current groups, uh, this is a list of who we are. I thought rather than start at the beginning, at this point, I would kind of define where we are as an ensemble so that you can see how we've grown through time. So this is a list of all of the different performing, we call them elements, in the Pershing Zone ensembles. To start with, the concert band. This is the group that I'm a part of. This is where, when Pershing started a band, he kind of started with the concert band. This is where we began. This was our first, our first ensemble, which is why I wanted to start with that one. Uh, this is a clip. I'd like to kind of show y'all a little bit of what each of these groups do rather than just try to describe it. I think that's an easier way to define our music is to show you our music. So I'll only do maybe 30 seconds of each of these. So don't worry, it's not a huge, huge performance. Um, but in this, we're actually playing the Hindemith Symphony in B flat. It's just a selection from it. <laughs> If at any point I forget to stop listening to something, I apologize because I kind of get excited about a lot of these things and don't want to stop them. So that's just a clip of the Hindemith Symphony, which just an interesting anecdote about that. That piece was actually written for Pershing's own in the 1950s. And it's one of the biggest pieces for uh, wind ensemble for the military band format. I think that's pretty cool. So the ceremonial band, I'm going to talk a little bit about how the band went overseas and fought in World War II. And when we did that, a group of musicians had to stay behind in order to cover all of the duties that happen in Arlington Cemetery, the White House, anything that was going on in this area. So the ceremonial band was actually half of the original band that kind of broke off to create that ceremonial unit. Uh, this is an interesting point to me because this actually really defines what it is I think our band does, which is we adapt in order to accomplish whatever the mission is that we need to do in that given moment. So at that time, we needed a band to go overseas and we needed a band to stay here. Now we have two bands. So this is how the ceremonial band was founded. One of the things that happens a lot in the ceremonial band is the playing of um, wreath layings at the Tomb of the Unknown. And there's a great video here of one of our buglers playing taps that I'd love to share with you.
The playing of taps is one of the highest honors that our musicians perform, um, which is why I did want to show you. Um, usually when we perform at the tomb, there is a full band present and we'll play the anthem of our country and then whichever dignitary is laying a wreath, we'll play that anthem as well. And then taps will, will follow that. So because TAPS is such a big part of Arlington Cemetery, the um, cemetery itself decided they wanted to honor the musicians by creating a bugular statue. I just put this in here as sort of an anecdotal fact. Uh, this is Sergeant Jesse Tubb. He's a great guy, but he got selected to be the statue. If you ever go to Arlington Cemetery in the visitor center, you'll see him, like literally him. They sent him to New York and made a professional. It looks just like him. I mean, it's almost like a wax figure. It's kind of crazy. Um, so that's kind of the way that they decided to immortalize the playing of taps in Arlington Cemetery. Um, I'll also mention at this point, I created just a handout. I'll put it in the chat at the end, but it includes a link to everything that I'm going to share with you today. So if you want to go back and see a full performance or you want to learn more about any of this, you can just use that handout and click on the link to, to listen to the whole thing. So there's actually a documentary about the making of this statue, which I'm not going to play, but just know it's on that handout. If you want to know more about it, you can, you can check it out. Like I said, Arlington National Cemetery is uh, one of our biggest missions. Um, we play all of the funerals there, uh, the full honor funerals for soldiers. Um, it's usually four a day and that's the full band. So this is a full-time job. Um, it's uh, a big honor to be able to help the families. So I wanted to just show a clip of what that looks like. The ceremonial ban also covers any arrivals of dignitaries that happen at the Pentagon, they happen at the White House, uh, state funerals when those happen, inauguration, the marching of the parades, all of that falls to the ceremonial, the ceremonial ensemble. The next group that was created were the strings in the 1950s. The strings are a unique group because they allow us to create an orchestra. We are the only a uh, premier military band with an orchestra at least twice a year. And um, they're, they're called the strolling strings because they'll wander through state dinners and they'll look happy and they'll play and all their music's memorized. Um, and this is just a little clip of them playing in uh, Amazing Grace. <laughs> That's the string group. The chorus came right after. It used to be the men's chorus. Now it's just the army chorus. Uh, they are one of my favorite groups. I am a big groupie. And this is one of my favorite pieces that they play. So 
so that was actually our big 1812 concert. At the end of every summer, we do a really big outdoor extravaganza. It's usually under the Washington Monument. That was actually on Summerall Field at Fort Myer. Uh, but it's one of our most highly attended performances. Um, we pull out all the stops. There's always a guest artist. Sometimes it's Miss America. I mean, it's this is a big concert that we do. Uh, but that was one of the songs that they covered last year, two years ago. I just love it. That's the chorus. The Herald Trumpets are definitely unique to us. Um, they are a famous ensemble. John Williams has written for them. They've played at the Olympics. They've played at the Super Bowl. They've played just about everywhere, That anywhere you'd need a fanfare. Lots of pictures of them on the White House, lots of pictures of them playing for the president of France and the Pope and the Queen. And they're just a very popular fanfare ensemble. So this is a quick little clip of them playing actually at our holiday show. I mentioned that we can do an orchestra. This is one of the times that we do an orchestra performance every year for the holiday festival. guys. It's really amazing to be a part of a group where I genuinely get excited when I hear my coworkers perform. I, I just, I love that. The Army Blues, again, we have this incredible blues jazz group. Um, this is Bob Hope, like they've just played with everybody. It's amazing. Um, and this is just a clip of them at Blues Alley. All right, we're almost done with this part, promise. So in 2002, we were invited to work with the USO and actually support Operations Enduring Freedom and um, go overseas and perform for the troops, uh, which was an incredible honor. It was so many people wanted to volunteer for this from our unit that it became an incredibly select group of applications. Like you really had to, to get it. You had to retrain on your weapons. You had to go in full battle rattle. I mean, it was, this was an intense, an intense gig. So they actually created another group for it called Downrange. They wanted a rock element so that it was something that the troops could really could get behind. It could be something uplifting and entertaining. Um, and it had a smaller footprint than a full concert band or a full jazz band. So this is just a quick clip of what Downrange does. Let that bass line move ya. Let that bass line move ya, say hey. They're super catchy. Um, every couple years, they do a show called Deranged, which is a big holiday uh, Halloween performance. Massive costumes and set design, and the audience comes in costume. The general comes in costume. Um, it's a lot of fun, and there's a bunch of videos online of them doing Deranged. So that's something that Downrange has been really, really fond of. Uh, Army Voices, our most recent large ensemble. They're an acapella group. Uh, they usually perform with the concert band, so I showed a quick clip of them doing a little show called Hamilton. So that's Army Voices. 
Uh, the groups that I didn't include on here were some of the smaller ones, the Brass Quintet, the Woodwind Quintet, um, and Country Roads. All of those have been formed in the last five years formally. The Brass Quintet has existed for a long time, but formally those have become major ensembles with huge job uh, re requirements simply because of need. Uh, one of the leaders wanted a country band, so we formed a country band and it's a group of five people that get together and they go and do state dinners and they do performances in small groups. So um, like I said at the beginning, we kind of adapt in order to accomplish whatever it is that we've been told we need to accomplish. So where did we come from? I, I mentioned that in 1922 is when we started. We began in, I don't know if you're familiar with the Virginia area, but we started in kind of a Southern Virginia. Then we moved to DC to the Fort McNair area. Then we went to Fort Myer, which is where Arlington Cemetery is. And in 1978, we moved into a state-of-the-art performance facility 40 years ago, and we're still there. And it's a little less state-of-the-art. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an old building. It's an old building. And we keep um, trying to get a new facility. We've sort of outgrown it. Because if you think about it, 40 years ago, we didn't have all these ensembles. We didn't have all these, these job requirements. We didn't have these needs. Uh, so there's six practice rooms for 250 musicians. We have two rehearsal spaces, which are constantly being utilized. It's, it's definitely, we've, we've definitely outgrown it a little bit. So hopefully the next time I present, I'll have another picture of our new state-of-the-art performance facility. So in the 1920s, one of the things about the band, if you look at the history of the band, it's a list of places played, people played for, events covered, uh, is pretty much what you will see when you see this. Bunch of diplomatic missions, a bunch of ceremonial missions. That's sort of our primary role and it has been since we were originally founded. So this picture is actually at the World Series, which is pretty neat. In the 1920s, that's when radio was starting to form and become very popular. It became, you know, every house had one, you'd sit in the living room, you'd listen, right when the band was being formed. And so the band hopped on radio super, super fast. They were averaging four performances a week on the radio and um, listeners were polled and they said that the army band was the foremost band on the air. So for decades, we were on the sound waves. Like that was just where we performed and how we were able to reach uh, the American people. In World War II, as I mentioned earlier, the band actually did go overseas in order to perform. Uh, we put together this D-Day musical tribute, which is actually a really neat documentary. I just want to show you about 60 seconds of it because it talks a little bit about what it was like. And there's some interesting footage of the band actually traveling back then. <laughs> To go to a concert, they would get on trucks, you know, two and a half ton trucks. The, you've seen them in the, the, the hoops and the cloth cover on the back. And the, the, they were constantly lost and late. The, all the road signs had been taken away because the, the, for, to try to thwart the enemy, but it also thwarted themselves. And they're constantly uh, coming to a crossroads and looking at a map and trying to figure out which way are we going. And then to get there and play a concert and get back on the truck and get back late at night. And, and in some places play multiple concerts in the same day. It's just amazing to, 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 try, to try to pull off. The, the, the band's role during World War II is a similar function to what we're doing now. Uh, it's, it's both interacting with the civilians and uh, serving the military. Uh, so for instance, in Morocco, uh, the band uh, set up in their tents uh, Captain Desart Darcy decided, well, let's do a parade and a little concert in town. So they just marched into town. Well, Morocco had just been liberated, and you have to understand, you know, under the, the Nazi regime, it was quite oppressive. And so for all of a sudden, for the, the shackles to have come off, uh, the band marched into town, and the newspaper reports, and this is, it's, it's mind-boggling for us to consider now, but they say that somewhere between 20 and 40,000 people spontaneously poured out. They said women were screaming and throwing flowers, and it just, 
the guys couldn't, they'd never seen anything like it. Oops, okay. I love this picture. Um, they're aboard the LB Evans going to Sicily. It just, yeah, it's amazing. They came under fire. They were firing back. They were diving for foxholes. Um, in 44, they played for the staging areas of Normandy and the D-Day invasion. And then later that year, they played for the hospitals of the people who survived, which I, I just, this is so uh, above anything that I have encountered in my, my career. Um, it, it really is mind blowing for me to think back and imagine like having my clarinet in a foxhole, it is incredible. Oh, this is a concert that they performed right after this was freed from the Nazis. And so people were just hanging off the buildings. It's incredible also to me that they managed to schedule where they were performing. It's almost as though they would go to whichever area had just been freed and celebrate with those, those, those civilians. And I can't imagine the kind of uh, power that, that came from that connection. Uh, that year they were actually attacked um, and one of our clarinetists was injured and received the Purple Heart, uh, which is incredible. We are the only service band who has served in, in a wartime setting overseas like this, which I think is kind of awesome. Not awesome, but awe, like inspiring awesome. This is one of the most iconic pictures of our band in front of the Arc de Triomphe. So I wanted to include it. Skipping into the 1950s, this is where we started really harnessing the power of popular singers to sing with us of uh, pop culture in order to reach more of the American public. In the 1960s, um, playing for the funeral of John F. Kennedy was one of the bigger honors that happened in that decade. Um, all of these decades also include inaugurations and like this was funerals for the Vietnam War. We welcome back John Glenn. So like I said, it becomes a list of things that have happened. Uh, in the 1960s, there was no actual, if a president comes in, you've got the four ruffles, ruffles and flourishes. There was nothing for the vice president that was regulated. It was always just the tune of choice. So in the 1960s, uh, Hail Columbia became the song that was always used for the, the vice president. And that was because of the army band. I'll skip that part. The 1970s, welcome women. We've come a long way since then. And this, I just wanted to show you an example of what I mean. When I'm thinking of the 1970s for our band, playing for Queen Elizabeth, playing for the Japanese emperor, playing for the opening of Walt Disney World. I mean, the variety of missions that we cover swings from very ceremonial to very reaching the American public. Same thing, 1980s, playing for the Olympics, playing for a summit between Gorbachev and the US. I mean, it's just, it swings the gamut. 1990s, same idea. We've, uh, these inaugurations that I'm kind of flipping through, our band is part of the presidential escort and we are the very first group behind the police on every inauguration since this started. Um, so if you watch them in the future and you see the red hats, just know that that's us and you know all about us. On September 11th, um, we had missions in Arlington Cemetery that could see the Pentagon, they could see the smoke. Um, this flag is actually from our band building. It was the biggest flag that they could get access to quickly. Uh, and we did have people from our unit go and help rescue missions at the Pentagon. The band also did a performance at the Kennedy Center and then immediately went to um, Ground Zero to perform a ceremony there. We've played for, like I said, the inauguration, state funeral, Super Bowl, Pope's visit, 
you name it, the band has been there. Oops. One of the things that I think we do really well is international diplomacy. This is a list of places that the band has been. Um, the Norwegian tattoo, if you're familiar with military tattoos, it's an opportunity for a variety of military bands and performing groups to get together and sort of showcase what's unique about their culture, their country. Uh, so in 2012, the band went to Norway and did a tattoo there. And there's a bunch of videos like a day by day, Oslo day two, day three, day four. Um, and the link I'm going to give you in that little handout is this. It's the finale of the Norway tattoo. They also, we did a diplomatic exchange with China, which um, they came here one year and we played at DC, New York, Philadelphia, the big venues. And then the next year our band went to China and we played at uh, Beijing, Shang, Shanghai and Nanjing. And I was a part of this uh, opportunity and it was truly remarkable. Um, so I did want to show you one little clip from, this is a great, it's an hour long documentary about what it was like to do this exchange. And it's fascinating. Like. I don't speak Chinese and the clarinetist that I was playing with did not speak English, but we were still able to make fun of the director and complain about our reads, which were both French reads. I mean, there is so much commonality when you start speaking the same language of music that I, I feel like using the band for soft diplomacy makes a whole lot of sense. They call it ping pong diplomacy, right? I feel like the friendships we started forging in the United States are definitely in root now in China, which again, it, it really does highlight that it does work, that friendship and cooperation through music works. By having music performed, which crosses all borders, brings people together, we can at least make advances in this relationship, which I say and others have said is so very important. I think we're learning. I think we're learning that there's a way of understanding from enhanced communication that we can leave a better legacy for our children than what we experienced in years past. Music is just a bridge. Through this kind of uh, communication, we believe that uh, it can be used for the two armies as well as the two countries. I think the goal has been achieved. It really is a neat documentary. If you're curious and have time, it's worth worth checking out. Uh, just a quick mention, things have changed a lot for us with COVID as they have for everyone. I have not played my clarinet for the army since last March, uh, but I have been working very hard building virtual education programs and taking temperatures at Fort McNair for the headquarters building. We also have people working at the commissary and we have people working at Raider Clinic helping people know where to go. So um, COVID has been very different for us, but we have found ways to adapt and accomplish the mission. The 2021 inauguration was challenging for uh, a variety of reasons, but still, even though there was not a parade, there was a presidential escort. So the band was still a part of it. And you can see in these pictures um, that yes, they picked Biden up at, the Capitol building and then they escorted him to the White House. So we still fulfilled this mission in spite of some serious challenges. So that's my general overview of the Army Band. I definitely wanted to have plenty of time to hear what it is you're interested in hearing more about. Um, so if John, you want to chat about anything that I mentioned right now before the interview, I'm happy to do that. I can stop my screen share if that would be good. Um, yeah, no, I, um, I had a lot of questions uh, for you uh, before you started and your presentation um, really generated a whole lot more, but I um, wanted to just first uh, address everyone uh, at home watching this uh, to kind of tie things uh, from uh, the sergeant's presentation uh, back through the, the long line of American history and music. Um, a lot of the things that she was talking about reminded me very much of um, uh, musicians' uh, roles and activities uh, from long ago. 
uh, you know, at, at the opening of the presentation, we looked at all the different ensembles, all the different facets, all the different uh, the ways that musicians are, are used. And if you think to yourself, geez, there's an, there's an awful lot of ensembles. Uh, there's an awful lot of uh, uh, different things. Well, musical trends change, of course, and you might get uh, a, a jazz band or a, sort of a, a harmony road show, a vocal group and things like that. But uh, th this is just part of the, the musical heritage. Uh, if you look back at uh, the early 19th century and, and, and the 18th century, even when bands were, were very small units, maybe six or eight performers uh, in the band, when uh, the army is putting out calls for musicians, they are looking for uh, multi-instrumentalists. They are looking for versatility in their performers. So uh, uh, you might uh, play the French horn uh, out on the parade field, but you also would need to double on a string instrument if you're going into some kind of evening soiree for, for entertainment of the officers. So to have uh, a tremendous diversity uh, in the music corps is a very important thing that goes all the way back uh, uh, to the 1770s uh, and, and throughout United States history. So, so uh, that's a parallel that we can draw uh, from, from our uh, entire history as musicians. And you know, you talk about um, uh, the band utilizing radio in the 1920s. Uh, uh, this sort of thing, uh, it was a new technology, yes, but uh, before that, you know, music, of course, uh, was used uh, to sort of promote uh, the army, to, to promote a recruitment, to keep people's interest. Um, and, and bands would perform in towns, you know, uh, just to generate uh, the buzz. And, and we see radio doing that uh, throughout the 20th century. And uh, during World War II, uh, they had that tremendous moment uh, uh, where they're speaking about uh, the liberation of Morocco and, and the band being there and sort of marching into town uh, and having the ladies' presence. And, and, and this sort of thing happens uh, in all eras, you know, uh, when you see uh, a city is liberated or, or even conquered. Uh, it seems like the band is, is one of the first units to march into that city behind the advance guard to sort of announce the arrival uh, of this army and to play uh, patriotic music to infuse the populace with with this, with this, these new ideas that are coming in, these new people, this, this new army. Uh, so you can see that uh, uh, throughout the American wars of uh, uh, the revolution and the war of 1812 of using the musicians uh, to sort of announce the army as a whole. Uh, and, and so that's a tremendous parallel. It's the more uh, we host uh, uh, personnel of the military out here, we always love talking about the similarities and differences uh, between uh, the old days and the modern. And it is remarkable in some regards how, how little things have changed uh, despite the gulf of time and technology um, that, that the army uh, can still find roots um, or, or the roots of the army can still be felt uh, in, in the modern day. And of course, with, uh, with COVID-19, uh, you mentioned the musicians being uh, moved out uh, to the hospital wards and you're taking temperatures. Uh, and, and just monitoring people's health. And this was one of the major, the major uh, duties of musicians uh, um, in, in days gone by. Uh, before a battle, uh, the music corps, uh, the band would absolutely be reassigned to the hospital staff uh, to be running wounded back to the surgeons and, uh, and helping, uh, helping the army doctors out in, uh, in whatever their needs would be. So uh, you uh, taking temperatures and, and, and serving uh, um, the nation in that regard is, is it's strange to see, but also uh, somewhat warming to see that uh, musicians are still uh, performing those, those roles. And uh, you also mentioned uh, Hail Columbia, and this is a, this is a piece that's dear to me uh, because in the 1812 community, uh, musically, this is one of the most important songs uh, that we play. Uh, sort of the, the President's March. This is an old, old American song that goes back to the Washington administration. And uh, we play it out here every day at the fort um, uh, for the raising of the colors actually at this time. Uh, so it's a tune that I know very well. And it sort of functioned as a unofficial national song for the United States uh, until the adoption of the Star Spangled Banner in the thirties. Um, so it's wonderful to see that the band still plays, that still holds it in high regard and honors the vice president uh, uh, in that way by, by using um, one of our very uh, sacred songs, um, going back a long, long way. 
So very, very cool parallels that we're seeing all over the place uh, without me asking any questions uh, to compare the life of uh, musicians now um, from the past. So, so excellent. Um, you had talked a little bit about um, uh, being in a forward position and having to, to undergo uh, weapon training again. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that. Um, um, way back in, in, in the 1780s, towards the end of the American Revolution, uh, it was decided that, that musicians, uh, field musicians, not necessarily the band, but certainly field musicians, uh, could not be recruited just for the musical purposes, that they had to come from the ranks. Uh, and this was gonna eliminate a lot of problems that the army was having. Uh, with musicians um, um, not being able to follow certain orders, not being able to perform certain duties. And so uh, all musicians had to be trained as, as soldiers first and know how to handle a weapon and know how to march. And so I just wanted uh, you to address uh, everybody and kind of talk about um, um, you know, your experience in, 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 in training and, and sort of being a soldier first um, you know, as part of the United States Army. No, that's a great, a great question. And yes, we are soldier musicians. So we are soldiers first. And I went to basic training. I was trained on my rifle. I had to do throwing the grenade, the smoke chamber, everything. Like we go through it all. And I am grateful at this point that we did have to do that because it does allow me to feel like I am part of the army. I am a soldier. Being called a soldier and pretending to be a soldier would make me feel a little bit like I was deceit, deceitful or deceiving someone. I am wow. so, so wow. I am pleased that I can say I am a soldier first. That is fantastic. That's a that's a powerful statement, uh, and that's very good that you feel that way. Um, is uh, is uh, any kind of weapon uh, reflected in the modern uh, uniform that you guys carry? Uh, soul, uh, swords or sidearms or anything like that? Our patch is actually MDW's patch, and it's a sword protecting the Washington Monument, but that's basically the extent of it. Oh, we have a sword in our crest, crossing a mace. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, well, we talked about the hospital ward uh, already, um, and historically, musicians had uh, a lot of other duties uh, besi uh, besides being assigned uh, to the surgeon staff. Um, you see musicians um, uh, in charge of the guard room, actually, in history. Uh, it was their job to keep the fire going and to keep the guard room uh, clean, um, to act as uh, the orderly for whatever uh, officer was uh, on the guard mounting. Uh, so there's some official duties there. And musicians are involved in uh, punishment, actually. Misbehaving soldiers that have been found guilty in court martials. Uh, those punishments are often carried out um, by the musicians, either uh, you know being drummed out of camp and set free, or you know in the British Army actually flogging uh, other soldiers. Uh, and, and and there's a lot of stories of of musicians having you know a difficult time uh, being able to do this, but um, not maybe just yourself, but you know other musicians uh, in in your unit. You know, what, what are some of the other things that you find yourself doing or, or are assigned to do that, that uh, an ordinary person wouldn't associate, you know, the army bandsman as, as doing this sort of thing? We have had to pull guard duty on Fort Myer before. So actually checking the vehicles that are coming on post is the first thing that springs to mind when you mention it. All of our other collateral duties are essential duties for us to function as an entity. So things like supply, transportation, all of that also falls to us. So we all do everything in order to make the band work. Um, we all have extra jobs that are not just playing our instrument in order to make the band work. Um, in your talk, you, you had mentioned uh, the red hats, uh, the very distinctive red hats. And there was that wonderful uh, uh, video of, of um, Amazing Grace uh, with the with the string players, uh, and it was nice to see uh, to see the hat in that sort of situation. But um, uh, are there uniform distinctions that you have? So if you were simply walking down the street, anyone would be like, "Up, oh, that is an army musician." Uh, 
uh, in the uniform. If you can see behind me, uh, Lee and I already talked about this, but for those of you at home, uh, this is a uh, musician's coatee from the War of 1812. Uh, and it is very distinctive. This would stand out um, um, uh, like a sore thumb. Uh, it is, is what's called reverse colors. So the army coat from this time is actually blue uh, with a red collar and red cuffs. Uh, and the, and the uh, musicians are gonna wear uh, the reverse of that, the exact opposite. So they really kind of stand out and can be found by the officers uh, when necessary. Um, so uh, with the red hat in mind, are there other things uh, other cues on the uniform now that um, that distinguish you as a musician? Yep, let me share my screen real quick. I have a picture and it lists everything. Um, one of the biggest distinctions, our red hat, we're the only pe people in the army who wear that red hat. The other distinction that's super quick to notice is our rank is upside down, which is a throwback. We're the only ones in the army allowed to do that. Um, and it's back to the Civil War style uniforms is the reason that they're flipped. And then there's a bunch of different things like there's the eight buttons which are supposed to represent the notes of the staff and the gold braid is decorative. Um, but really the, the two quickest to notice things would be the red hat and the upside down rank on the arm. Well, the, it's nice to see, uh, yeah, the color red so, so well reflected, I guess. Uh, and that is a definite piece of uh, a heritage that, uh, that has continued to the Army. So that's really, really nice to see. The eight buttons, I had no idea. That's, that's uh, a kind of a sly thing. Um, uh, really, really cool. Uh, so neat. Uh, I'm going to think about that when I have to, you know, put all 12 of these uh, together uh, tomorrow. So, <laughs> so um, excellent, excellent, excellent. Well, um, We'd like to open up the floor if, if anyone uh, at home has uh, additional questions. And um, as we said, we're kind of talking about army music. Uh, yes, Pershing's own, but also kind of throughout American history. So if you have other questions that date from an earlier time period, uh, hopefully we might be able to, um, to, to nail those down. So you can start um, fidgeting with your typewriter if, uh, if you're thinking about um, thinking about anything and we'll try to monitor those questions. Um, and while we're doing that, I'll just um, kind of think of some more, but uh, you showed a clip of, of the funerals and it seemed like you this is a, this is a busy task for you that this is a, a duty that you have to perform frequently. Um, is that at all uh, a taxing on the musician? Um, here at Fort Meigs, uh, we had quite a lot of deaths and uh, the, the formal funeral was actually outlawed by general orders because uh, the soldiers hearing the funeral songs from the musicians day after day and hour after hour, it actually began to wear on the morale of the other uh, soldiers. And they did away with the, the formal ceremony. And I was reminded of that when um, um, you know, you were talking about the funeral ceremony and it seemed um, that, that you as a musician might, um, might feel the weight of these moments uh, and have to feel them often. Um, so perhaps you could talk a little bit about, uh, about that uh, situation. We have um, soldiers in the ceremonial band who perform two full honor funerals every day for 30 years. And yes, it is emotionally draining. It's also physically taxing because of how long you're at attention in the elements, doesn't matter, hot, cold, we're out there. Um, I think that one of the things that helps is they do distance the band so that you can't audibly hear anything that's happening at the funeral. Um, and we tend to not be facing directly at it which sounds like subtle things, but it, it does help because there have been times where we have been a little closer and you can hear the grief and that is very, very taxing emotionally. Um, it's also, they are so behind in their, their burials at Arlington Cemetery that the majority of the families who come, it's been eight months to a year since they lost that family member. So they've kind of processed their grief more than if it was was a fresh recent pain. 
I know it's still not easy, but it, it's a little bit removed from uh, an immediate grief. I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, it does. Um, um, yeah, it's, uh, I am, I'm very pleased. Uh, well, I'm, I'm proud and very, um, and very happy um, to, to be able to learn this and, and kind of speak with you and, 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 and you know, be made aware of, of this sort of uh, knowledge, sacrifice, and, and, and deep thought, I guess. So um, I am just looking through, um, through some of the questions here, and we've got a lot from Sue, uh, uh, some busy stuff here. Uh, let me see if I can find some good ones here. Um, during, uh, during the Civil War, did both sides have military bans? Um, yes. Um, the American Civil War is often called the most musical of wars uh, because of the numbers of musicians that are involved. Uh, and we're talking tens and tens of thousands of musicians. Um, you know, when you compare army music in, say, the First World War, we're maybe looking at seven and a half thousand um, similar numbers for World War II. And now, uh, uh, Lee, you might be able to answer, I think, maybe 6,000 or so in, in the modern um, military era. They've recently cut, there used to be 99 army bands, and now I think they're into the 70s or 60s, high 60s. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so, so with the Civil War, yeah, uh, you, you have to understand that this time period was um, the whole country was electi uh, electrified with with war fever, and entire towns uh, signed up uh, to go to war, and that included the town bands. So you would uh, often have an entire band um, join the army as a unit, and they had already rehearsed, they already knew their music, and they're going to take that into the field with them. And uh, the Union Army had slightly larger uh, musician um, bands than, than the Confederates were authorized. But uh, yeah, you see uh, uh, both bands, uh, both sides uh, using musicians uh, to great effect uh, in, in the American Civil War. And uh, another question uh, was about um, um, uh, instruments changing. Uh, from the modern era um, uh, from history. And yes, uh, we, can, we can dovetail this into the talk of the Civil War because by the time you get to the mid 19th century, you're seeing uh, brass instruments come into the bands uh, in, in a lot greater role uh, because the, the, the technology, the construction of those instruments uh, is evolving and brass instruments can play a lot more chromatically, meaning they can play, uh, they can play tunes uh, uh, like the woodwinds uh, had done before. And, uh, and brass, of course, is a much louder, more sonorous sound and a little bit more effective for military use. Um, uh, so yes, you go from a, a wind dominated uh, sound um, in the late 18th and early 19th century with flutes and clarinets and oboes and bassoons and things uh, to more of a brass sound in, in the 19th century and then beyond uh, uh, into the 21st where you see uh, the footage there of bass guitars and um, and, and, and all kinds of stuff going on in, in the modern era. Uh, um, uh, Trudy asks, uh, the drum in the TAPS performance had a very ornate design with an eagle and uh, one of the other photos had a similar drum. Where does this design come from? And I actually do not know where the percussion designs come from, but they guard them and they uh, very take them very seriously. So I could definitely find out, Trudy, where that came from. I thought maybe it was related to our crest, but it is not. Thinking about the crest, it doesn't have an eagle. So I'm not sure where that came from or why it's on the drum. Yeah, um, um, uh, decorating the drum is, is uh, an ancient uh, ritual practice. Um, and I can't speak to the exact uh, design that was on the one from the clip there, but um, you know, typically um, uh, the drum the, the drum was painted uh, in, in the color of the facings, uh, especially in the British Army. A lot of the different regiments had uh, various colors of facings, 
uh, to indicate what regiment they were and the drum would be uh, uh, decorated in that regard with that face and color. And uh, in, in the war uh, of 1812, we see a lot of um, uh, the American Eagle, which was kind of a new symbol for the United States uh, uh, during this era uh, and sort of the national symbol. <clears throat> but uh, you have to understand that the drum becomes very much um, a symbol of uh, the army, a symbol of uh, the regiment in very much the way the standard of the colors do. And you know, to have your unit's uh, drum taken from you was a disgrace the way it would be to have uh, your colors taken from you on the battlefield. And so soldiers, uh, you know, the drums were stacked in camp uh, right behind the colors, uh, sort of symbolically. And, um, and the drum kind of becomes a, almost like a mascot for a lot of the troops and, and a great symbol. And whether they, they, they thought of the musicians uh, in the same high esteem as they did the instruments, you know, you can't really say, but uh, uh, the emblazonment of the drum is uh, very important for soldiers um, throughout history. Uh, um, let's see here. Uh, Al writes, uh, do you have much interaction with the other service bands uh, other than the formal multi-service uh, performance occasions? We do a bit, um, especially all of this distance uh, performing. If you look at any of our YouTube channels or on our websites, you'll see that a bunch of our musicians have been working with other similar musicians in different groups in order to create inter-service performances during uh, Zoom, during virtual jam sessions. Um, just trying to clear out the queue here as we uh, answer different questions. We're not musicians in the early days quite young. Um, uh, yes and no. And I'm glad you, you, you asked this question um, because uh, this gives us a, a chance to kind of address the, the, the mythology of the, the drummer boy. And I use that term mythology uh, rather carefully. Uh, because I don't want to uh, give you the idea that uh, drummer boys didn't exist. They certainly did. And yes, you could be recruited in the army at a much younger age um, uh, in the early days. Um, <clears throat> but you have to understand uh, uh, that uh, the majority of serving musicians, duty musicians uh, in the army are going to be uh, grown adults. Um, you have to remember that this is a time where if you were going to learn a trade, you would do things uh, sort of through an apprenticeship. You know, if you were going to be a, a sailmaker, let's say in Boston, uh, you would work in the sailmaker shop and do the craft jobs for many years and kind of help uh, the master uh, with his different tasks throughout, throughout the day as you slowly learn the trade. And it might be several years before you could go on and be your own master. And the parallel is not quite exact, but it is similar with the drummer boys and the drum major. Uh, the way the army classified musicians uh, was you were either fit for duty or you were a learner and a learner is quite obvious uh, it's going to take a long time for you to learn all the music that you have to to be able to perform at, at a moment's notice um, on the battlefield or in camp and um, this is a very long process so if you join the army at uh, 14 or 15 years of age um, you know and, and you're studying for four five six years um, when you graduate and become a duty drummer, uh, you're going to be the same age then as the other soldiers uh, serving around you. And that's going to add to the uh, uh, esprit de corps uh, of the unit. Uh, there was a great paper written uh, by Stephen Ball um, um, addressing uh, musicians in the British Army during the American Revolution. And he kind of went through all the different uh, uh, regiments from that time period. And, and look at the demographics of the musicians. And, uh, and on average, yeah, uh, musicians will be in their mid 20s and even their mid 30s and, and mid 40s. Um, so, so I think when something is exceptional, uh, like a very young person being in the army, that kind of sticks in the mind uh, a, a lot. And the more exceptional it is, the more it sticks. And that sticking in the mind over time through history can, can evolve into this mythology. And, and we almost think of all musicians being drummer boys uh, from long ago. 
Uh, and there's also physical things to consider. I'm sorry, I just keep going on about this, but uh, this is a subject I love talking about. So, so forgive me, Lee. Um, there's size considerations, you know, um, the British army had a, a strict rule of uh, five foot five. Uh, you had to be five foot five if you were going to serve in any capacity. And if you're an 11 year old uh, and you're four foot nine, you're not going to be serving. And then there is the physical size of the instruments. Um, uh, field drums are large. Rope tension field drums are big. Uh, mine, you know, uh, goes down um, uh, to the mid calf, closer to the ankle, actually. And if you're a small person, uh, you know, they don't make uh, beginner sized drums uh, for the army. So, so if you're a small person, you're physically not going to be able to, to, to carry that out. But yes, uh, young people do serve in the army uh, in the 18th and 19th century. Uh, and that is, that is a tradition, but it is not the only tradition. Uh, and, and, and we need to uh, remember that. Being familiar with uh, General George Custer's performances of Gary Ullman and The Girl I Left Behind Me were regimental bands, uh, were regimental bands the standard at that time, i.e. did each military unit have its own band? Um, uh, yes and yes and no, they certainly could. Um, uh, regimental bands might, might very much be up to the commanding officer, or uh, if you're talking about George Custer, uh, if, if bands signed up for your unit at that time. Uh, in the early days, you know, regimental bands were strictly uh, paid for, uniformed, and equipped by uh, the colonel or the regimental commander. Um, um, and that's slowly going to change over time. I don't have exact um, information on, on, on when that begins to change. Um, but uh, but uh, music is going to be very important to George Custer um, uh, in particular. Uh, Custer was known for bringing his musicians uh, onto the battlefield, which is which is quite rare, and playing um, uh, in battle. And his uh, predecessor, uh, General Sheridan, Philip Sheridan, also uh, liked musicians uh, on the battlefield and actually had drummers mounted on horses. Uh, believe it or not. Uh, Gary Owen and the girl I left behind me have been part of the American songbook since uh, the French and Indian War, as far as I know. Um, um, and the, you can find those in songbooks uh, throughout the ages. So great tunes, uh, great history, great question. Thank you, Gary. <clears throat> um... Uh, someone had asked a question about your degrees. Um, if you're a, a, a do certain do certain degrees in the academic field qualify you for certain ranks in the current army, or or how does how does the ranking system work? We're actually unusual in the band. Most of us have masters and or doctorates. If you saw us in the regular army, you would assume we would be an officer because to be an officer, you need a college degree. So to have all of these highly educated enlisted looks a little bit strange. Um, we're unique in that you have to win your position after a kind of grueling audition when we have a spot available. So right now we have a baritone vocalist spot available. So people are sending tapes, they'll pick a handful. Those people have to go through MEPS, which is the military processing to make sure that they're even eligible to win the job. Then they come and they audition, which is a multi-round full day of bearing your soul to the world. And they'll select one person to then become that baritone player who will then go to basic training. When they go to basic training, they go as an E4, which is normal for anyone who has a college degree. If you go to basic training, that's the rank you start at. But then as soon as you get to our unit, after three months, you get promoted from E4 to staff sergeant, which is E6. And in the regular army, people will take an entire 20 years to get to E6. So the way they reward all of our college degrees and our previous education is by advancing us through the rank and starting us out as a staff sergeant, as a non-commissioned officer. Our, our conductors are officers. So if you did want to be an officer in the band, you would need to go through the conducting route. Um, so, it, but it's still all uh, about uh, your your musical abilities. Basically, um, uh, you don't. There's not a ceiling where it's like, well, you don't have a doctorate, so I'm sorry, we can't we can't uh, do anything for you until you, you know, uh, wish you had a better degree. Sorry, you know, right. sort of thing. 
Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And yeah, to speak uh, to the education level, um, uh, music is uh, uh, ferociously competitive and, um, uh, and a lot of schooling is necessary. And, and again, this is true uh, uh, of history. Um, these are professional musicians who are recruited for the army bands uh, in the early days. Uh, and, um, you know, you have to be able to play something, uh, looking at it for the first time and play it exactly perfectly. Uh, you know, we, there is no room for mistakes, uh, at this level. Um, so, so excellent. Um, as the, as the band ever been, uh, featured in, in, in Hollywood films, you know, especially if you think about the mid 20th century and, and, and the kind of, uh, and the, you know, very proud sort of American, uh, post-World War II era. Uh, do you know if the, the band's ever uh, been to Hollywood? The band has been in two movies. I will not remember the titles. They were later than you'd think. One of them was a film about Indiana, actually. Uh, Garden Roses. Ugh. About Indiana. There's a shot of the band actually playing. Um, but nothing from the era that you're thinking of. Like nothing. Oh, okay. Well. Which surprises me. Yeah, I would think that would be the time. <laughs> Garden Stone? Is that a movie? <laughs> I've been, you're not talking to a film buff here, so so uh, sorry about that. Um, is your um, is your um, uh, rehearsal facility, uh, your performance hall, is this uh, at all open to the public for for tours? Normally, right now it's not because of uh, COVID, but uh, generally, yes, it's a public facility. You can walk in. We have displays in the lobby that kind of go through the uniform history and the history of the band. Uh, and our rehearsals are open. So if you were to come in and sign in, you could sit and potentially watch whatever was going on on stage that day. Here's an interesting question and uh, kind of a two part one. Um, uh, do you guys at all coordinate, um, you know, with uh, the National Park Service or National Military Parks, you know, and, and travel to historic sites uh, like uh, Mount Vernon, uh, Gettysburg, places like that? Um, and do you ever uh, uh, mix it up with, uh, with the, the, the reenacting scene, uh, you know, uh, Civil War era bands or Revolutionary War era, you know, uh, Fife Corps and things like that? So the Army has... a has four special bands. One of them is a fife and drum corps also stationed on Fort Myer. And we do a bunch of jobs with them. We do a twilight tattoo for kids every Thursday throughout the summer and we march and they march. Um, so we do work with the uh, fife and drum corps quite often. The National Park Service, we have to work with them anytime we wanna do anything in DC uh, under the Washington Monument, Lincoln Memorial, all of that goes through them. Doing things at um, Gettysburg, we've played at the conservatory there. We haven't played at uh, Gettysburg like battlefield style performances, probably because it was before us. Um, not that we would be opposed, but it seems like they would probably want to go to a period group to, to add to the, re, the reenactment of that. We do one job at Fort McHenry that um, talks about the writing of the national anthem and the bombardment and what was actually seen and mm -hmm. It's, it's a beautiful ceremony, it truly is, but we are surrounded by reenactors at that point when we're performing for that. Um, uh, uh, is there, this question uh, is coming from Alicia, uh, is there any uh, pressure to, to, to move on, to sort of age out, to retire uh, from the bands? You know, or, or is there an effort to make room for, for new recruits and things like that? You can stay in the band as long as you can stay in the army. We have the same retention requirements that they do. Um, I, I will say my original plan when I was offered this job, I wanted to be a college professor. And so I took the audition in order to understand more about how to take these auditions so I could teach kids how to take these auditions. But when they offered me the job, I said, okay, I'll do one enlistment, sure, why not? So I signed on for three years thinking I would then go back to my dream of being a college professor. But uh -huh. after three years, I, I wouldn't, I can't imagine leaving. The people are amazing. The opportunities are fantastic. And it's really opened my eyes to what service means. And I'm incredibly grateful for that. Um, so, so you kind of got, got the experience and then, and then fell in love thereafter. Um, this, was, this was not um, something that you strived for outright from the beginning. Correct. 
Wow. We do have um, our euphonium players tend to strive for military bands because there are so few opportunities for euphonium performance majors out there. Yes, I can imagine that's true. <laughs> yes, but a lot of us other than that instrument fell into this and fell in love with this. Wow. So so euphonium is 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 the shark tank, huh? Yeah, that's, that's hilarious. <laughs> Uh, but great. I'm glad I'm glad there's a gig out there. That's that's sweet. Mm -hmm. um, Gardens of Stone was the movie that you were thinking of. Oh, uh, yes, I was close. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, Kelly, uh, Kelly, our site director um, is, is always quick on the draw for answering for answering questions uh, of a random nature like that. Perfect. Uh, whenever the Internet is is, is close at hand. <laughs> well, um, I think I speak for myself and uh, several people that have uh, left uh, chats and comments and questions. Um, uh, I think everyone out there in the audience wants to thank you for uh, your service. We know it's, it's a tremendous honor uh, to, to be defended by such a tremendous army and to have such uh, you know, uh, tremendous, uh, beautiful musicians uh, that's, that serve. Uh, so I think everyone out there just wants to say thank you uh, to you, Lee, uh, for all that you do and uh, for the music that you bring to, to so many people, um, you know, year after year. Uh, that, is a, that is a language that, that strikes deep. So uh, we thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me here. And I learned so much from everything you were sharing. So thank you for that. <laughs> you bet, you bet, you bet. Um, if there are no more questions, I think we'll we'll kind of begin wrapping things up here, uh, everybody. But uh, the lecture series continues. Um, uh, a month from now, we'll be talking with author uh, Peter Cousins, uh, who has a new book out, um, uh, Tecumseh and the Prophet, um, which is a subject, of course, right in step with what we do here at Fort Meigs. Uh, so it's always great uh, to have a chance to speak with uh, an author uh, who's recently finished a book, especially if it's on a subject uh, that's so close to home as um, uh, as American Indian uh, issues and the, the War of 1812 and how it how it impacts our history. So be sure uh, to turn uh, tune in for that lecture um, one month from tonight, uh, March 18th, uh, on the same on the same link. So uh, thank all of you for uh, tuning into the show tonight and. Um, We'll see you again. And uh, Lee, it's been so great getting to know you uh, the last uh, couple of weeks and months. Um, I hope this is, I hope we meet again. And this is not the last time that we talk. So uh, keep, keep me in the loop of everything that you do and bring the band out here to Fort Meg sometime. We got a lot of space. You guys can stretch out and really jam out here. So we would uh, love that. <laughs> make, we're, we're gonna make it happen. We're gonna make it happen for sure. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right, well, good night to you. Thank you so much for the presentation and uh, we'll see you out there. Great, thanks everybody. <laughs>